Some nights you were up far too late this Saturday night before preaching because your congregation is hosting a rock concert from a famous indie rock artist. That's, this is one of those weekends. So, two rabbis, a Unitarian minister, and the editor of a local alternative weekly newspaper go to a Louis C.K. event together. That's just true. Last fall, there's no punchline, last fall, two rabbi friends of mine and me and a, a buddy of ours who's uh, an editor of a paper in town all went together to go see Louis C.K. perform, the comedian from the reading this morning. And we all got out and talked about how good he was at giving a sermon. Because we saw in the context of this hour addressing really profound elements of the human experience in a way that didn't have to be censored like it does in educational settings or political speech or a sermon. To just be honest with a group of hundreds of people about the funny and sad and terrifying things about, as he said, being a person. What I read this morning when I saw that interview the first time was a person who was dealing with a lot of the same kind of stuff that I'm dealing with. Now, if people didn't have trouble paying attention to the present moment years ago, the Buddha wouldn't have been writing about it in 500 BCE. This is not just a product of technology. But we're not really set up to just sit and, as he says, be a person and face with some honesty the reality of the human condition. He talks about this desire that we have to take that first bit of sad, that feeling, oh no, here it comes, I am alone, and distract ourselves from it or numb that feeling in any way, and I'm sure each person in the room has one or many I do ways of making that feeling go away. Sometimes I even preempt it. I know that it gets to a point sometimes where my wife and I will be having a conversation and she will stand up and go to the next room and she's going to be back in 15 to 20 seconds because she's just getting water and I reach for my phone to fill that little bit of space where I'm not okay even being bored. Not shamed, grieving, just bored. It's difficult to just sit with that. And he's talking about this moment where he's driving alone in his car, listening to a song, and he gets that feeling, except it's embodied. It's not just that he knows something's going on. He feels this sense of sadness. And instead of texting 50 people to say hello, he says, he pulls over to the side of the road and stops his car and cries. Cries. And he says that there's this moment where he actually feels grateful for having this kind of moment. That he's tired of living in a world where he's mediated the extremes of happiness and the extremes of sadness into a little manageable window where he's just kind of satisfied with his products until he dies. And the reason that reading stood out to me so much is because I had an experience that was really similar to that last year. I was driving home by myself from our annual minister's retreat, where ministers from this part of the country that are Unitarian Universalist clergy get together, and we worship and work on programs. And I was leaving the retreat center outside Houston, driving by myself on this long stretch of two-lane Texas highway, and I was the only car that I had seen for a long time. And I started having what I think was a panic attack. But I don't know because I've never had one before. My chest got really tight and it was hard to breathe and I felt this pressure around my jaw and my temples and I was short of breath and my shoulders hurt. And I had this awareness that one day my life was going to end. And that that ending was permanent. That in the history of the universe, I would not be a lot longer than I would be. And I know that. I, mean, I know that. But I'm not sure I had felt that in such an embodied way ever until that moment. 
And it was, for me, terrifying because I have a lot invested in being in control of my emotional life. Keeping it together is very important. There's a lot of shame in losing that capability. And I did what he did. I just pulled this car over to the side of this highway and turned it off and just wept. I don't know if there's anything else I could have done, but I'm glad that I did. I'm glad I didn't text 50 friends to say hello or turn on another radio station or, or pull over to get something to eat or a million other things that I could have done. I'm glad that I just sat in my car and felt this feeling because it has transformed a lot of the way that I'm trying to approach my friends and family and the people that I work with, whether they realize it or not, who knows. Uh, but it has been really profoundly touching to me in the relationships that I have. And it wouldn't have been the same if I didn't feel this thing that I didn't ever want to feel, ever. And I thought it was really interesting that in the reading, this comedian is tying two things together. One is how difficult it is in the face of a difficult or painful experience to just stop and sit and be a person that that is related to our ability to show up and be compassionate for other people. He said if his daughters couldn't stop, then they couldn't learn how to be good for other people. And actually, I think that that ties in quite a bit to the kind of scriptural stories we tell. So most of you are familiar with the book of Job, right? Okay, we've got heads nodding. But that book in the Hebrew Scriptures is generally cited as an answer to the question of why in suffering? Why does this happen to human beings? And I actually don't think it does a very good job of answering that question. That might be its answer. But I think it's instructive in the question of how we respond to other people. Here's this book. It's 42 chapters long, and they're all verses. It's a long poem. So you should take that in mind when reading it. It's not meant to be prose. It's meant to be poetry and metaphor. It's a 42-chapter poem in which 38 of the chapters are Job and his friends arguing about why he's suffering. 38 of the 42 chapters. The first two chapters, God and Satan get in an argument about human loyalty, and so they agree together to test this human by taking his family away and all his riches and covering him in boils and making him sick. And in the last chapter... Everything is made right again because he's loyal to God. And everything in between is bickering about pain. In one sentence in the book, I think that they get it right. It says that he's in this tremendously painful situation. And he sits down and his friends come from out of town. And they sit and sit down on the ground with him in silence for seven days. And the sentence says they didn't say a word because they knew that there was no word big enough for his suffering. And they just sit there in silence for seven days. And then they start to talk. And it all goes downhill. A person in the first service said maybe they weren't getting good enough feedback from Job about their helpful presence. That might be true but they start to explain it away. Well, maybe you did something to make God angry at you, or perhaps you just don't understand it, or haven't you read the books, and you don't know that wisdom is beyond our comprehension, and he keeps coming back with, you don't get it, this is terrible. And then he's railing against God himself, and finally God talks back, and that's not helpful, because God speaks to him and says, wait, what, you think you were there when I created the universe? Did you measure the planets? Did you create the animals? Do you have any comprehension of my whole plan? And Job, in a response, which I think is actually him saying, okay, if you'll just stop talking, I'll give in, says, fine, you're big and I'm small. He says, and this is a really interesting line, Job says, and there's different translations, but the New Revised Standard Version, which is the one I go off of, says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. His friends have been telling him why his suffering was wrong, and when God finally speaks from a storm, it says, 
Who do you think you are? Not anything one person says to him, including God, helps. The best thing anybody ever does in that story is to show up and sit down and be quiet for a long time. You know, to be a person. But that's a lot harder than it seems. Um, I had an experience recently where being a minister kept me from being able to do that for a friend. I have a friend who has had a tremendous amount of suffering in his life over the last six months, and he happens to be a person who has a lot of friends who are also clergy or counselors or people in helping professions. And as our friend, we felt a lot like Job's friends. And we would stand outside in the parking lot before going in to meet our friend, and all these clergy would say to each other, what are we supposed to do? We said things like, if he was a member of our congregation, I would know it was okay to call. That's my job. But have we been calling too much? Have we brought too much food? Should we stop coming over? What did you say to him? And it all became about us. And instead of being there sitting down with our friend, we're wringing our hands in a parking lot about whether or not we're going to say the right thing because we are trained in how to say the right thing. We had to give up the notion that anything we could say or do would take away the real pain of our friend and know that the best thing we could do was not to be clergy, but to show up and be quiet and be a friend. But it's this weird paradox that I think our tradition does embrace that actually we lessen our pain and create more joy in the world when we don't run away from our pain. I think we can internalize this cultural story of Adam and Eve, which I know when I was a kid was taught to me as, a long time ago, people didn't get sick or die or feel pain in childbirth or have to work until somebody screwed up and now you have to get sick and die and somebody's going to feel pain in childbirth and it's all somebody's fault. There's a tremendous amount of shame that we carry with us if we believe that normal human experiences like guilt or anger or shame or loneliness are somehow not human. Kathleen read that reading from the Buddhist teacher Tara Brock this morning about the sense that so many of us carry with us for decades that there is fundamentally something wrong with me. This is not that we don't need to change but that when you experience greed or isolation or great joy or exuberance, none of these things are less than human. See, in our tradition, we believe we grew up out of the earth. We weren't thrown onto it. And that's what I think she's talking about in radical acceptance. Not resignation. I don't think what she's saying is, oh, there is injustice and abuse in the world. Oh, that's life. I should accept it in a radical way and let it be. And what she's not saying in this Buddhist wisdom is that radical acceptance is sitting by and watching people in our lives suffer because that's life. What I think she's talking about is the wisdom that comes from practicing the ability to meet reality with compassion before we respond by fighting it or fleeing. Practicing our first response to what is real, being compassion, before we fight or flee. Because let's face it, most of us are going to end up fighting or fleeing many things. I will. But it affirms that there's this radical thing that happens when we can stop and pause and meet our own pain or the pain of somebody sitting in a room with us and say, this is okay. Anyone who's been in a 12-step group knows that this is foundational to that wisdom. Facing what is real is transformative. Now, I think the good news in this is that we can get better at doing that. Or I wouldn't be working in this profession if I didn't think we could get better at doing that. We practice meeting what is real with compassion by making space in our lives where nothing else is happening. Where we can do what Louis C.K. was talking about and Tara Brock was talking about, Stop and just be a person for a minute. 
to put our phone in a box when I come in at home, uh, when I come home from the office and let it sit there for a few hours. God help me. To know that every day coming home and sometimes that glass of wine or that television show or even that jog around the block are ways of preempting feeling what I actually feel. Or feeling that impulse to reach for something to eat or a different channel or something to distract myself from these feelings and for just a moment, letting it be. Those of you who have ever gone on a retreat of any kind know that the more time you have and the quieter things get, the more you discover about yourself. People who go on silent retreats for a week will often say, you know, on day three, I realized I don't really like my sister. <laughs> but that we don't know those type of things about ourselves unless we make space. I think we practice meeting what is real with compassion when we learn to name what is before we respond. Um, when you train as a chaplain in a hospital, and I'm assuming that this is the case for a lot of counselors and other helpers, there's this mantra that they kind of gave us, which I thought was incredibly cheesy at the time, but became profound for me, which was, don't just do something, sit there. And they would say, remind yourself of that when you get freaked out and you go into a room where somebody's in pain and you don't have the right thing to say, don't just do something, sit there. And the ability, my teacher said, was to do that and then, either inside you or verbally, to simply say what's happening. So I watched this woman who'd been a chaplain for a long time and was a lot better at it than I was, who was my mentor. I was kind of shadowing her when I was learning. We were in a room with a person who was dying of a very, very painful condition. And his family was gathered around and I watched her transform this space with three words. She said, so much pain. That was it. And this sense of relaxing into the moment for the friends and family in the room just took over. And this guy kind of lit up like somebody got it. And they started talking about what it was like and what he wanted at the end of his life. I just watched this moment transform when just the words were said, so much pain. She wasn't trying to judge it or explain it or tell him it would all be fine. She paused and sat there and said, what was? I think also part of learning to meet what is real with compassion means literally showing up and sitting down in places where we don't necessarily want to be. The hospital room of a friend who's suffering and we don't know what to say or do. Or a town meeting, community meeting where we have to hear about some difficult aspect of our city or our country that we don't want to face because it's uncomfortable. Or a phone call from your mother or your mother-in-law when you could just press the button and know that actually they are in pain. Or a million other things in our life where we can actually practice saying, yes, I will enter into this moment and let it be. So in our church, our big theological answer is not that if you do all of this right, you are going to escape the human condition. I cannot promise you that I know what happens when you die, and I cannot promise you that if you follow the formula, a supernatural God who is not happy with you now will somehow be happy with you. Our answer is beloved community. Our answer is showing up for one another as best we can. The good news is we have exactly what we need to do what we're called to do. You don't have to be an expert to show up for a friend who's in pain. You don't have to shame yourself for feeling fear or anger or isolation. You don't have to numb yourself from the human experience in order for it to be good. And that the only thing we're really ever called to do is show up in the lives of people who need us and be a person. And we can do that. And that, to me, is good news on this Sunday morning. And to that, this morning, I'll say amen.